Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we explore convenient yet effective shortcuts that will help you get ahead and move forward faster by becoming a better leader. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbaugh. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Leads, and today I'm excited because I have somebody on the show who's going to be able to share a whole wealth of experience with us that I know is going to help us all move onward and upward faster. Fred Halstead was raised in the western suburb of Chicago called Wheaton. His parents bought a property with seven acres, a good-sized house, a guest house, and a barn. His father, an architect who led the oldest architectural firm in the U.S., decided to completely remodel the old house. So Fred and his two brothers and parents slept in the guest house for two years while mostly the family rebuilt the house. Work ethic and accomplishment was paramount. After the reconstruction was complete, Fred and his older brother returned from a weekend visit with friends to find that dad was laying out the area for a new swimming pool, and he had decided that he and his brother Gray would dig it out by hand, put the rebar in, and then contract for pouring the floor, walls, and deck. During high school, he also gained the experience of team sports by playing on a football team and running track. Wabash College, a very small liberal arts college in Indiana, fit Fred's need for a broad education. After graduation, he attended Northwestern University Graduate Business School. When the draft board reclassified him and called him to military duty, he decided to volunteer for the Air Force. After OTS, he served as an officer in the Office of Special Investigations for four years, the last 18 months as commander of the office. Among several adventures in the Air Force, the best thing that happened to him was meeting and marrying Donna. After three fairly short jobs in financial management, he began a career in executive search. Fred started his own firm, which later merged into an international firm. In 2003, after many years of assessing the talents of executives and culture of clients, organizations, and consider, considerable noodling about how best to use his talents, a new career in helping leaders become more successful called. Halstead Executive Coaching was formed. After 40 years of observing, assessing, and coaching leaders, Fred wrote a book reflecting what he has learned. It is focused on the skills needed to be an inspiring and highly successful leader. Leadership skills that inspire incredible results also resulted from the positive results of a highly interactive program that he has presented to senior level leadership teams for the past five years. Fred's foundation and rudder are his faith and his two most important blessings are his faith and family. Fred and Donna have two exceptional children who married extraordinarily well and they have three wonderful and sweet granddaughters and all of them live in the Dallas, Texas area. Fred Halstead, are you ready to help us get over the hump? I am, Jim, and thank you so much for allowing me to spend this time with you and your viewers. I'm really excited about it, and I would say I know you are such a skilled interviewer, and this is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> I appreciate that, Fred. Now, I've, I've given, and just, just so for those that aren't aware, if you may be watching the video, we also have audio. So it's audio and video podcast. So Fred's going to be all over. And so I've given my legion a little bit about you but can you tell us what your current passion is so that we get to know you even better? Well, thanks. My passion really revolves around something simple, and that is whatever I can do to help other people uh, be successful, that's really what stirs my passions. And um, it's just really exciting for me. Otherwise, I'd probably be retired by now, but I just enjoy so much what I do uh, through my coaching. Well, you know, as they say, I mean, why retire when you enjoy it, right? I mean, you do it until you can't do it no more. Yeah, that's right. So when I started thinking about, you know, your history and where you are now and all of that, I started thinking about what you just said and talking about, you know, the whole executive search component. You know, I mean, for me, uh, you said something about, you know, your passion uh, and things that charge you being about helping others be successful. But how does that happen with a search process? I mean, to me, it's you're gathering some information and you're going and finding somebody and you're placing somebody, but where, where do you actually get that fulfillment in that process? 
that really it came for me from the hiring executives because it's extremely important that one know what the company needs and what that person who's going to be the boss needs or the chairman of the, of the board, the board, what they need. So while it might be apparent what a CFO does and is supposed to do, each company is different. And to bring out the information that you need to truly understand what that company and what that new boss truly needs in the person um, is helping them to be successful. And then on the candidate side, um, make sure that they are actually a good fit for their sake as well as the company's sake and to help them in the interview process. So, I mean, you mentioned a really important word that I hear a lot lately, and that is that whole fit thing. Because, mm -hmm. um, talking about culture, talking about DNA, talking about, you know, t team effectiveness, talking about all of those things. For me, I also start immediately going to the whole customer experience, the employee experience and the customer experience. And so from an executive search process, you know, I wonder how much importance was actually placed on those key things in regards to experience, experience of employee and experience of customer. Did you see things can kind of change throughout the years or you know, was it something that really wasn't in place or it was always in place? Well, the experience is key and the experience is one of the keys actually. And it's something that's very easy to, or easier to identify and measure. So you usually start with that. You'd start with, what has the person done? What have they accomplished? And then the, the even more important piece is what drives and motivates that person? What is their character? I have seen very few people not be successful because of a lack of intelligence or knowledge. It happens, but much more often it happens because of a lack of character, a lack of drive, and skills that are somewhat innate and difficult to measure. Okay, so that leads me into the work that you're doing now, really, because if I'm talking about you know, leadership skills that inspire incredible results, I mean, are we, are we really dealing with essentially a very limited uh, pool or source of people that could actually reach these heights? Well, the book is aimed at the same people that I typically coach, which is senior level executives. And yet, when I give the program that's based on the book, The Skills That Inspire Incredible Results, it just turns out it's very interesting, Jim, because I'll ask what skills have been most useful? What have you found that's most practical? And part of that comes out, you know, in listening and asking questions, particularly. It's been very useful at home. I've noticed a big difference in my kids. When I start asking them questions that begin with what, it brings them out, just like it does with my subordinates and my peers and my boss. So it, it turns out it has a very broad application uh, for almost anyone. Okay, what you were just saying also makes me think about something that I often talk about and is that it's a tri trickle down effect of leadership and that is that all of this money, if not billions of dollars throughout the globe is spent on developing the very top level of organizations with the thought that you know, all of that skill, ability, framework, processes, all that stuff will trickle down to the front line, but that's not what happens. So for me, I like on the Fast Leader Show is to bring it down to practicality purposes the people who are on the front line through the call center coach leadership academy, uh, as well as, you know, that mid-level leader who could really benefit from a lot of things that those senior level people are getting, but just don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. so when we start talking about, you know, the, these leadership skills that inspire incredible results, and you just talked about even an impacting the family at home. I mean, what does it mean for people from a overall organizational perspective to build skills in these core areas? Well, the implications are extremely broad. If you were to become a better listener and you are a, a leader in a company, it is amazing what happens because the people around you are gonna feel more respected. You're gonna learn more. 
And that's going to translate into you being a much better and more successful boss and a higher level performing person. The same holds true of asking powerful questions. The same is true, and this is one of the most difficult things, Jim, and that is for highly successful leaders to step back and say, I'm going to ask some questions here, let's say, of you to bring out your best thinking rather than me tell you what I'm pretty darn sure I know is fact. And what I'm pretty darn sure I know is what should be done. It's really hard for people to feel like, okay, I'm just going to spend a little bit more time here asking questions and listening and getting your best thinking. So then you end up owning what it is that you're responsible for doing. So obviously approach is extremely important in how you do that. And even in the book you talk about in, in one particular section, you say people are smart. But if your intention is to guide a person to your way of thinking or the solution that you know to be best, others will realize that fact. And so that's yeah. what you were talking about. So, but, but what, else is, or what else makes that a particular problem? Well, it's people can see through us very easily. When we're genuine, people know it. When we're not, people know it. Um, how many times have you witnessed or heard someone else say, yeah, the boss will ask me questions, but I know darn well he knows what he wants me to do, and I wish he'd just say it. Well, that boss isn't genuine. That boss isn't really interested in learning what you think. That boss is interested in telling you what he or she thinks. And it's like, it's not even much of a foggy glass there that people can see right through. Well, and on, on the other side of that coin, because I've run into this problem too, where I've tried to get people to share with me what they think. And, and sometimes they're just sitting there saying, just tell me what to do. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I run into that in my coaching. Because I'll start asking questions. They're, they're coming to me wanting answers. And I'm reflecting back to them. Okay, here's one question. Jim, this is a tough problem. So I'm acknowledging that it's a challenging issue. If you could think of just one thing that you might do first, what would that be? Well, I've freed you to stop looking at all the complexity of it and all that sort of stuff and just focus on, okay, let me think. If it's just one thing, oh, okay, I can talk about that. And that gets the conversation going. And so the person goes from, and I don't know how many times this has happened in my coaching and can happen in other people's leadership, is the person, no, I just want you to tell me, I don't know, I wouldn't have asked if I knew, to, ah, in not a very long period of time at all, thinking, man, I figured this out. I'm smarter than I thought I was. And by the way, my boss is pretty smart too because he helped me figure it out or she helped me figure it out. Yeah, I think the important trap there as you were talking, I started thinking about my potential impatience with that, meaning that, you know, you ask and they come back and say, just tell me what to do. My, and your, my response has to be an additional question is what it should be. Yes. Get them to actually bring that out. And if they yes. still are persistent and say, well, I don't know, I still need to ask another question. And then for me, I just need to let it go if they can't respond. So maybe through time, they start realizing that they're going to have to think. Well, I was going to say you create a habit. So the expectations have changed. And one motivation you mentioned it's really tough to just sort of sit back and ask the questions when you think, I know what to do. I'm just going to tell them. Well, is that really in their best interest? One of the themes of the book is when you want everyone around you to be highly successful, you're going to be more successful. And one of the ways to have people around you highly successful is to bring out the very best in them 
rather than show the very best of you. And that's hard. We'd all much rather shine rather than bring out the glow in the other person. You know, I think you bring up a really good point and an important distinction that I often have to talk about. And I think this is a great place for it is that we unfortunately call coaching something that it really isn't. So coaching is when we actually help to bring out what's already in the person. And if we're yeah. going to be stopping and giving the answers, we are no longer coaching. We've just changed the dynamic. We've just changed what that activity is. It's now we're training or we're mentoring or we're, mm -hmm. we're no longer coaching. Yes, that's right. And that was really drilled into all of the students at the coaching program I went through, and I'm sure it is in every coaching program, but the one at uh, University of Texas at Dallas uh, was one of the first at the master's level, uh, really would drill that into us. And it turns out that there is, and I think this is very true because I've witnessed it in leadership as well, there's a real balance between what you said, because we all have some wisdom, and we're going to cheat that person if we don't bring out some of that wisdom, mostly through the questions we ask, but occasionally through a little bit more direction. So it's not a total either or, but the more you balance it based on bringing out the best in them, the better they're going to be and the more successful you're going to be. Okay. So for me, this kind of all brings it full circle, Fred. So I can see now, based on what you described in regards to your executive search work and your coaching work, how all of this fits because there was a lot of inquiry. There was a lot of discovery. There was a lot of this that went back. So I can see how the transition became quite easy and where the mm -hmm. path parlays. And also probably why, you know, your executive search organization was acquired and brought into a larger organization. It's because of that type of work. Yes. And this is sort of interesting that others can uh, use as well. When I was in the search business, of course, I really started to ask a lot of questions, and it was really important to me to understand what the needs were and understand what that potential candidate um, is in terms of who they are as a person as well as a leader. So there were several instances when I was interviewing the hiring executive, and he'd say, Fred, well, Boy, you know a lot about this. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know much at all about it, but I wasn't fully honest. I just kept my mouth shut. And, but it was all through the questions. I was listening and I was asking questions based on that. So people think you're smarter than you really are when you do that. And in my case, that was real important. In the book, you also talk about something I think we often – fail to do. I think we're all guilty of it. I don't think anybody's immune from this particular issue. Um, you talk about two things that are most important for us in regards to our development. Uh, you talk about having an accountability partner and then also having intentional peer practice. So why are those two things important? A um, couple of reasons. One is the accountability partner is, is just, it makes us help to be more accountable because we've got someone who is assessing what we're doing and saying and in a way is helping us. So it bonds us to that person. It creates a vulnerability, which is very healthy in terms of saying, you know, Jim, I really need to work on this. And you're thinking, yeah, Fred, you do. Uh, and I'd like you to help me. So I'd like you to just notice when I'm doing this or when I'm not doing this or how I am doing this and just let me know. I would really appreciate that. So it makes that connection. It helps you and it helps them. Well, so, I would also think that it also takes, takes away a lot of uh, the, um, I, I guess, you know, f fear in fear in the whole thing. It, it takes away a lot of, um, vulnerability, I add some vulnerability to it. Yes. 
we have to be able to get that type of feedback in a, in, in a way by which we don't feel intimidated by it. So I, can, I think being more intentional is really important. So what about the peer practice? The peer practice uh, came about as a result of the program I give uh, that I call STIR. And that is, let's say there's a group of 20 leaders of a company or a segment of a company. And they're all going through the program. Well, these skills, while on the surface, are so just sort of easy to understand. Yeah, they're all important. But boy, when you start to try and do them, it's really tough. So we practice. We have people pair up. And then they spend just 15 minutes each talking about a real business issue that they have. And oftentimes we pair them with someone with whom they normally wouldn't discuss that issue. So let's say it's a marketing vice president and we'll pair that person with the CFO. Well, those discussions normally aren't any more than you got to watch your budget or whatever. But when you start asking, in this case, the CFO, about a marketing issue you have, that gives you the opportunity to have somebody think totally out of their realm. It lets them have that opportunity. It brings the two of you a lot closer together and become more appreciative of each other. And you practice using those the skills in the book. So it's a, it's a tremendous way to build trust, camaraderie, and to build your competence in the skills. So I urge that people do that, and I'd urge your listeners and watchers uh, to intentionally go to a peer with an issue outside the realm of your responsibility and say, Jim, I've got this challenge. Um, could you talk to me about it and help me think through it. Very powerful. It is. And, and, and I would dare to say that that person doesn't even have to be in your organization because some organizations don't have That's true. go to people. It's, you still have to be able to seek out that type of person. We learn more in a community than we do in a class. And we just have to be more intentional and make sure that we incorporate that into our Yeah. Community. The advantage of doing it in your organization is then it's you're building that relationship with a person within your organization, which can help them and can help you in doing your work and getting promoted and all kinds of things. Well, and I think the, intent, the, the important note is here is that you have no excuse. You need to do it. Well, there are a lot of excuses, <laughs> but yeah, it's a good idea to do. And like all things, you've got to figure out what is motivating you. I really stress that, Jim, because these skills, again, are so difficult. If you don't figure out why is it that I'm going to really try and listen with more intensity, because that's hard. If I don't know why I'm going to do that, then it's so tough to actually do it. So to understand yourself, understand what motivates and drives you. I think the same applies when we start even talking about the customer and the customer experience. I mean, mm -hmm. if we put ourselves into this type of, you know, learning and, and we start projecting that onto our customer, it's going to have a significant effect on our overall business because the customer experience is going to get affected. Yes. I, I had an interesting example of that. It was kind of outside coaching, but a, a friend of mine who I've kept up with from my recruiting days, he's never been in the same firm. In fact, we competed against each other. And now we're neighbors at a, at a lake that we have a, a home. And he said, Fred, it was really interesting. I had this big search competing with other much larger search firms with the board of directors, and we were selected. And they told us the reason we were selected is because we were the only firm that really got into and asked them about what it is they think they need. The rest just told them what they offer. Didn't ask what that client needs, but just what I can give you. 
So when I start thinking about, you know, the experiences that you've had and the journeys and the interactions and the people you've met, I know that you're, you know, finding and being able to leverage a whole lot of inspirational things. And we do that on the, on the show by quotes. Uh, so mm -hmm. is there a quote or two that you can share that you like? Yes. One of them is um, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act. It's a habit. So very practical, but yet true. Aristotle. <laughs> yes, very practical to my book. Absolutely. So in, in addition to that, I mean, another thing that we, we actually get a whole lot of value from and benefit is by when our guests actually share times when they've had to get over the hump because we, there we find so much wisdom. It goes back into that whole community of practice and sharing things that mm -hmm. we learn from others. That's one reason why I'd love to do it on the show. So is there a time where you've gotten over the hump that you can share? Yes, um, I am. Jim, it's just, I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but I am a very positive person. So when it comes to humps, as I look back, I just, I almost don't see any humps. So as I reflect on that, I have to be really careful. My positivity can drive my wife crazy, and I'm sure other people. And I have to be very mindful that other people aren't like I am, that most other people will have regrets. They will get stuck, and it's harder for them to move forward. But in some ways, the more I understand that, and the more I can empathize with them, the more I can help them to move forward beyond those humps. One of my humps, I guess, was the when I had open heart surgery 11 years ago. And it, the surgery wasn't too bad. I, I thought it was just fine. Of course, I was asleep. Uh, the recovery really stunk. So that was a hump, but gosh, you know, it's just, it's turned out great. So the lesson there uh, is to be mindful of Every, everybody's not like me, and I'm not like everybody, and to accept that, and to work with it, and um, really be joyful about it. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. An even better place to work is an easy-to-use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, Fred, the Hump Day Hoedown is a part of our show where you give us good insights fast. I'm going to ask you several questions, and your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Fred Halstead, are you ready to hoedown? I am. All right. So what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? I would say that it's... Uh, confidence. I have a lot of confidence, and yet it could be easily argued that I should have more. What is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Understand what your strengths are and fully use them. What is one of your secrets that you believe contributes to your success? The fact that I am a positive person, that I've come to understand what my limited strengths are, and I take tremendous pleasure in using them um, every day. What is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Listening, asking powerful questions, and genuinely encouraging others. And what is one book that you'd recommend to our Legion? It could be from any genre. And of course, we're going to put a link to Leadership skills that inspire incredible results on your show notes page as well. Thanks. I think it's uh, the Fred Factor. It's a very simple book, and it's short, and I love short books. It's all about a postman who exhibits incredible talents in terms of customer service and love for other people. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information 
from today's show by going to fastleader.net slash Fred Halstead. Okay, Fred, this is my last hump day hold on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25. You can take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only choose one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? A great appreciation of all other people. The why is because when you don't have that, when you don't truly try and love other people, you don't have to like them, but you're going to miss out on a lot because you're going to spend time worried about what people aren't rather than what they are and what they can offer. Fred, it was an honor to spend time with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Yes, through HolstedExecutiveCoaching.com and Fred.HolstedEC at Yahoo.com. Fred Halstead, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. And the Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. <laughs>